Hello and welcome to this uh, narrated PowerPoint presentation on the topic of occupiers liability. Uh, what we're going to be considering over the next, I don't know, 45 minutes, hour or so, is the extent to which an occupier of premises might be liable in tort for harm arising from the state or condition of those premises. Uh, a general observation I'd make first is that we've spent most of last semester, almost all of last semester, looking at the tort of negligence and its various rules and how it applies in certain situations and how it might not apply in others. What we're going to be looking at here is actually how ideas of negligence, although not strictly the tort of negligence as we've seen it before, relate uh, to the condition or the state of premises and a liability of an occupier uh, in a negligence type situation for the harm that might befall somebody um, uh, uh, as a result of some condition or state of those premises. So just to get our eyes in, um, as uh, we do on, uh, have done on previous occasion, just a couple of little scenarios to get us thinking about, um, about the topic. The first one is uh, involves a Mr. and Mrs. Jones, not a very imaginative uh, uh, creation of a, a name there, but Mr. and Mrs. Jones are on holiday at the Bradford Holiday Centre made that one up, um, uh, with a, a three-year-old son. The child wanders off and follows a woodland path which leads to a concealed pond in the ground. The child falls into the pond and drowns. Um, well, obviously, uh, in this situation, the parents are going to want to bring an action on behalf of their dead child um, and uh, an action perhaps on behalf of themselves as well in respect of the grief that they've suffered because of the loss of the child. Um, the, the issue really is to what extent should the Bradford Holiday Centre, people who uh, run that centre, be liable? Clearly, um, any sort of woodland is a hazard to young children clearly concealed ponds in the grounds are a hazard to young children. So the issue would be whether or not there's liability uh, uh, for the death of the child. Well, on the one hand, the grounds do appear to be hazardous to young children. You might say, on the other hand, that parents have a responsibility to stop their children wandering off uh, in, such a, in such a hazardous place. So we'll see how the law tries to balance that up. But clearly in this case, uh, the Bradford Holiday Centre case, all the, the parents and the child uh, were, were lawful visitors um, to the, to the centre. Second scenario, slightly different. Um, a large number of people regularly trespass on Yorkshire County Council's land, using it as a shortcut to a railway station. Miss Patel, when trespassing, stumbles into a concealed ditch and breaks a leg. Here you've got a situation where somebody is not a lawful trespass, a lawful visitor, but is actually trespassing. People who often take shortcuts across bits of land uh, are actually technically um, trespassing. Uh, and in those circumstances, uh, you have to ask, should the law afford a remedy to somebody who's actually committed a tort themselves uh, by being on land owned and occupied by somebody else? Um, is there any kind of duty towards Miss Patel? Well, some people would say, well, that's her own fault, she shouldn't have been trespassing. Others might actually say, well, the ditch actually was concealed. And did the Yorkshire County Council know that people were regularly taking it as a shortcut? Might, as a kind of, I suppose, a bit of human decency might require uh, them to take action if there were hazards in that situation. So on the one hand, you can say, well, OK, she was a trespasser, that's her fault. On the other, you might say, well, yes, but you wouldn't expect um, uh, people to uh, be, uh, you, you'd expect rather that landowners might show a little bit of compassion, a little bit of human understanding, particularly when there are concealed hazards and they know that uh, trespassers might be in the vicinity. So we're going to see also then how the law deals not just with the situation invol situations involving lawful visitors, but also situations involving trespassers. Before we start looking at the law, as usual, a few preliminary considerations. So first off, 
the law of occupier's liability that we'll be looking at is based on statutory concepts of duty which are not dissimilar from the tort of negligence. They are, to all intents and purposes, the same as the negligence duty of care. But the point I want to make is that the rules as far as land, uh, as far as premises and occupier's liability for those premises are concerned, are based on statute. Now, at the risk of sounding a little uh, patronising. Just remember that when we talk about statute, we're talking about an act of parliament, we're talking about legislation. Uh, and putting to one side all the complications of human rights uh, or European uh, Union law and so on, that the in the hierarchy of law, uh, uh, statute law, acts of parliament are supreme um, and the courts are bound to, to follow, uh, to apply and follow those Acts. So when we're talking about statutory concepts, we're talking about rules that have been produced or are contained within an Act of Parliament. So liability, occupier's liability is based on statutory concepts, and I'll say what those acts are in a second. They are clearly very similar from what I've said to the idea of negligence, um, but it is not based on the common law, it's based on statutory duty. So secondly, you might say, well, why should there be a statutory approach to occupier's liability if it's going to be similar to the total negligence? And uh, the, um, in a way, the kind of harm that can befall people through carelessness on, uh, of an occupier of land is not going to be dissimilar to the kind of harm that could befall somebody through the carelessness caused by a driver. You know, um, someone falls into a ditch and breaks their leg um, is uh, by because of neglect on the land uh, is not that dissimilar from somebody who has their leg broken by a careless driver in a car accident. So why is there a statutory approach? Why is it contained within an Act of Parliament? Why, haven't, why, ha why wasn't Parliament content to leave the it to the judges to develop this area of law along the same lines as negligence? Well, the answer really is historical. Um, and it turns on, in a way, the complexity of the law, historically the complexity of the law, uh, concerning the legal status of individuals coming onto the premises. And prior to the 1950s, the rights, the entitlements of people coming onto other, another person's premises would depend to a certain extent on the reason why they were there. And entitlements varied depending on whether somebody was a visitor, uh, uh, so, uh, somebody, I beg your pardon, someone was invited in, or whether somebody was just permitted to be on those premises and so on. And so what the Act did was it decided it was time to tidy this up uh, and it consolidated all those kind of different sorts of of uh, visitors, invitees, and so on, into one category, the lawful visitor, and and then decided that, that there would be a single duty of care, a common duty of care, which is going to be owed to all of those lawful visitors, and we'll see m more of that in a bit. So, but the point, the real kind of the simple answer is, why is it different? Why is it contained in the statute and not left uh, just to, to case law, to the common law, to the judges? And the answer is, it's an attempt to address a complexity which existed now um, over 50 years ago. Third point I want to make is this is a quotation. We'll come across it again later on in a case we're going to look at Tomlinson and Congleton Borough Council. One of the law lords in that case said, "There's no reason for imposing a grey and dull safety regime on everyone." Um, this points clearly to one of the issues that could easily develop uh, if the judges were too quick to give remedies in occupiers' liability cases. Um, when I, uh, a, a little anecdote perhaps from my own uh, experience, uh, from the age of about seven onwards as a child, I, I spent uh, every autumn, winter and early spring um, playing rugby, uh, and which uh, usually involved getting thrown on the ground and stamped on, on the ground and stamped on. Um, when my own children were young, 
um, we once were due to go to their summer sports day which was to be held on a field um, outside uh, the school uh, but it was uh, it was called off and the reason it was called off was it had rained in the morning and there was a concern that the children would slip on the grass and might hurt themselves um, and what Lord Hoffman in this quotation was getting at is that the, the reason the school called off the sports day is their concern was that if children slipped running in the egg and spoon race or the whatever um, then in those circumstances an action uh, uh, might be brought against uh, against against the primary school, and Hoffman is saying, Lord Hoffman is saying, look, if we're not careful, uh, uh, we are just going to end up in a situation where we have a grey and dull safety regime for everyone. Many things that people choose to do of their own volition are actually quite dangerous things to do and in fact the reason why they choose to do them is because they find that thrilling whether that's um, whether that's skiing whether that's rock climbing uh, canoeing whitewater canoeing and so on um, and uh, the the approach of the law to occupiers liability is to say that actually there are many hazards associated to certain kinds of things certain certain sports for example which in a way are obvious or which people choose to run for themselves um, and the law is going to leave that as far as possible uh, the risk with the people who have chosen to undertake those kind of activities um, because if you don't then will never be able to do anything um, uh, there will be a grey and dull safety regime so we can and we can see that so it is worth well worth bearing in mind when we look at these cases some of these cases there is a kind of there's almost like a sort of I wouldn't say a myth because that's putting it too 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 harshly but the idea that there's somehow we have a compensation culture well an argument against that maybe not a complete argument or completely um, um, convincing argument is actually look at some of these occupiers liability cases uh, there are clearly little evidence of the judges being prepared to support or promote uh, uh, a compensation culture many of the people's claims failed because uh, the risks inherent or the dangers inherent in what they're doing were obvious and they were treated as people who've chosen to run those risks the fourth point then just straightforward is that uh, the 1957 Occupiers Liability Act governs the duties uh, to lawful visitors and the Occupiers Liability Act 1984 governs duties to trespassers remember I made at the beginning a distinction between the liability uh, of uh, to lawful visitors and then also separate approach liability uh, to trespassers so the duty the approach is similar but there are some marked differences as one well, as you probably expect so turning first then to uh, lawful visitors and the 1957 occupiers liability act right so now just remember that this is an act of parliament so you will have to uh, make sure that uh, it, for your preparation for classes and so on that you get the acts and 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 read them the good news is particularly the 1957 occupiers liability act is a very short act there's not a great deal to it um, and i think it's uh, written in a in a very clear way um, and uh, with a little bit of concentration its meaning is 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 not as impenetrable as you can sometimes find in legislation so uh, uh, the, the, 50, the 1984 Act is a little longer but it's still a very clear piece of legislation uh, when I say it's a little longer um, uh, the 1957 Act runs to about a page uh, the uh, 84 Act is just a couple of pages uh, with lots of gaps between the sections so um, Turning first, let's just have a look. I've underlined some key concepts, and there's one which I haven't underlined, which I want to mention. Just make sure that um, I don't uh, forget to forget to mention. So, section two, subsection one, says this: an occupier. So clearly, a key word is here is an occupier. What is an occupier? Of premises owes the same duty, and then it, the duty is described: the common duty of care to all his visitors except in so far as he is free to and does extend restrict modify or exclude his duty so you can see here what section 2 1 is doing it's actually just 
tidying up the historical um, the complication. So the occupier owes the same duty, the common duty of care, to all his visitors. What it is also allowing for is the possibility that people might choose to exclude that. For example, uh, uh, you've signs saying uh, you enter this, uh, you enter these premises at your own risk. For example, of course, whether or not those uh, survive the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977 is another matter. But the Act um, is saying that there is a common duty of care to the, uh, uh, owed by the occupier to visitors. Then the section two, subsection two, goes on to say a little more about the common duty of care, and we'll explore that um, in uh, further. But it says the common duty of care is a duty to take such care as is reasonable to see that the visitor will be reasonably safe in using the premises for the purposes for which he is invited or permitted by the occupier to be there. Right. Important point. The reason why I've underlined reasonably safe is to make the point that the common duty of care does not impose a duty to make sure that the premises are safe, but rather to make sure that the visitor is reasonably safe. So there can be hazardous um, premises uh, that the existence of hazardous premises in the, on their own does not breach the Act. The, the responsibility of the occupier is to make sure that the visitor is safe, not that the premises are safe. So we need to know who is the occupier, uh, who might a visitor be, and actually a little more about the extent of that duty contained in section 2, subsection 2. But before I turn to the idea of an occupier, I just want to make the point that the Act actually does give an indication as to what is meant by premises. So you need to have a look at section 1, subsection 3a, um, it's, uh, because it adds to, if you like, the list of what you might expect to be premises, which are land, building, and so on and so forth. Uh, premises include also movable structures, such as a vessel, uh, a vehicle, or an aircraft. So th um, that might be slightly uh, more surprising. So obviously, going into a shop, coming to university, is entering premises. But if you came to university by train, then, for example, in that movable structure, the train carriage, those are premises for the purposes of the Act. So, we need to look at the question of the occupier, what is a visitor, and a little more about the nature of the G. So, let's start with the occupier and the meaning of the occupier. Well, uh, according to, uh, according to uh, case law, uh, and, uh, and also to uh, learned writers, an occupier is a person who has sufficient or effective control of premises and there may be more than one occupier. So let's just sort of uh, uh, pause for a second. Right, sufficient or effective control. Sufficient control is a phrase used by Lord Denning uh, in the case of Wheat and Lakin. Uh, this is Lord Denning when he was actually one of the law lords before he decided that he'd go back to the Court of Appeal as the master of the rolls. So he says sufficient control. Effective control is a phrase used by Jenny Steele in her textbook on tort. But it's the, the, the key thing to remember, it's about sufficient control. It is not the same as owning. So you can have somebody who might own a premises who could be um, uh, uh, an occupier. You may have somebody who has some kind of control over the premises without necessarily owning them, and they could also be an occupier. And the case wheaton Lakin also illustrates the point that there could be more than one occupier of premises. So the facts of wheaton Lakin were this. Um, Lakin was a brewing company, um, and um, they owned a public house. I think it was called the Golfer's Arms. So they owned a pub, uh, and they put in there a manager, and his, the manager and his wife lived in the pub. And the and the building uh, had uh, was on at least two floors, from what I can make out. The downstairs area was the public house, and the upstairs area was the accommodation for the manager and his wife. Now, the manager occupied those premises, and his wife occupied those premises, not as a tenant, but they had what is called a license 
to occupy, and that was given to them as part of the uh, employment contract that they had, uh, that the manager had with the brewing company. Um, and one of the things that was permitted, uh, 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 one of the things that um, the manager, or more particularly the manager's wife, was allowed to do, was actually to take paying guests and give the, put the, give them accommodation in the in in the upstairs in the upstairs apartment in their private accommodation. So for their own profit, I guess as a perk, maybe you know um, they were allowed to then run something like a bed and breakfast operation. So that was the setup. The um, the the upstairs was uh, the private accommodation. Downstairs was the was the was the public house. Now, one of the um, the the uh, agreement between the public house between the brewers and the manager allowed the brewery to have access to the building upstairs and downstairs for the purpose of uh, inspecting uh, the premises but also for the purpose of making repairs as well. Now uh, turning to the events that uh, were the cause of this legal action, um, Wheat um, was the name of a couple who was staying upstairs as paying guests uh, and one night Mr Wheat was going downstairs to the bar and he was moving down an unlit staircase. The reason it was unlit was the bulb had been removed from the top of the staircase for some reason. So as he he was found dead at the bottom of the staircase and he'd obviously fallen. Now the speculation was, if you read the case, that what caused the fall was that the banister or the handrail uh, that he was, he was, uh, he, he he was presumably touching it actually stopped three steps above the 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 bottom of the staircase so in the dark it's assumed that what had happened was as he was feeling his way down he came to the end of the handrail assumed uh, that he was actually then about just above the floor and he then stepped out but instead of stepping out and onto the floor he stepped out uh, into into thin air and he fell and he was killed by you know, the blow obviously killed him so an action was brought on his behalf and the action was brought uh, against the public house, the brewers, uh, Lakin, and the one issue that t had to be decided was whether or not Lakin were occupiers of those premises. Well, applying the Lord Denning approach, it was a decision of the House of Lords, um, it was held uh, that uh, the brewers were also occupiers of the premises because they had the right to enter, because they had the right to uh, effect repairs, then in those circumstances they had sufficient control of the premises and therefore were potentially liable. In fact, uh, the claim failed uh, uh, and the reason for that was actually there was no explanation as to what had actually caused uh, Wheat's death, the claimant's death, so it was actually unclear as to the cause of the death um, uh, and there was no explanation as to who or how or why the bulb had been removed and remember that the burden of proof is with the claimant so um, on the balance of probabilities obviously the claimant was not able to discharge um, the burden of proving that it was a breach of the common duty of care that caused his death. Uh, so, but this case is still important, very important, because it tells us the occupier is one who has sufficient control and actually there could be more than one occupier. So in Wheaton and Lakeham, uh, the manager and his wife were also occupiers of those premises. Point to make though is that to be liable as an occupier, ownership and, and or possession uh, is not required as long as there is control. And Harrison Birkenhead shows that there can be control even when the premises are empty. Very briefly, what happened in Harris was that Birkenhead Council, um, as part of a slum clearance scheme, had compulsorily purchased um, uh, a set of uh, 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 a number of houses, and uh, and one of the houses uh, that they that they had given the notice uh, that they were going to enter, they'd effected um, the they put in train the compulsory purchase um, procedure uh, had 
was actually occupied by a tenant um, and the tenant was offered alternative accommodation but she chose not to take that accommodation uh, and she just left the premises. Well Birkenhead had had a policy of boarding up um, the empty houses uh, because children would get into them uh, and but unfortunately in this particular case they hadn't actually boarded they didn't board up the house and the claimant was a young child um, she'd entered the house which had previously been entered by other children who'd vandalized it quite seriously uh, and uh, she suffered very severe injuries to her head when as I believe she was six um, she fell um, from uh, an upstairs window uh, uh, and she fell 30 foot 30 feet uh, and banged her head um, and uh, as a result of that proceedings were brought against Birkenhead Council they had control of the premises even though they weren't in occupation they had effected uh, the compulsory purchase uh, and they had given the notice uh, to uh, that they were going to enter it was their premises that the premises were controlled by them and therefore they were going to be they were going to be liable all right so having looked at the notion of the of of uh, the occupier what's the visitor mean well a visitor is somebody who's either has an invitation or a license to be on premises so invitation in many respects is fairly straightforward um, I, uh, I, I I'm invited around to my friend's house for a cup of tea um, uh, or alternatively I go round to somebody's house I, I decide that um, I want to have a chat with them about something uh, my next door neighbour I want to have a chat about um, uh, about their overhanging branches or something I knock on the door they say come in I'm clearly I'm in uh, I have a I have an invitation so that's in many respects very straightforward so somebody who has either an invitation or a license to be on premises well license here is is really um, one of those terms that you often find in law where it can be perhaps explained in a slightly um, less uh, less uh, formal sort of way a license is in effect really just permission so somebody who is permitted to be on the premises and people can have express license or they can have uh, implied license it doesn't require anybody to have a piece of paper uh, it's not like a driving license uh, but it is just somebody who has permission to be on the premises so for example um, I might uh, if I if I go into a shop um, I'm, I have a license to be there I'm clearly I am permitted to be going to a big supermarket or something like that and there are many situations where it's clear that people are permitted to um, to, to 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 be on premises so the the the, uh, the postal workers uh, who walk up the garden path to deliver uh, the the post have a license to come onto the tra onto the premises so a visitor is somebody who is, has an invitation otherwise known as the invitee or somebody who has a license otherwise known as the licensee to be on those premises invited or permission but and this is important a trespasser this is perhaps obvious a trespasser is not a lawful visitor so the 57 Act deals with the invitee or the licensee but it doesn't deal with the trespasser that's the 84 Act and the important point I want to make really is this is that a lawful visitor may become a trespasser so somebody who is invited onto premises or, or permitted to be on premises for one reason who does something which is not permitted may actually become a may become a trespasser so if I am I am clearly allowed to be in uh, in in Tesco's uh, superstore to do my shopping I'm clearly allowed to be in the toilet if I want to relieve myself um, I, and therefore I'm a lawful visitor if I decide whilst I'm in there that I'm going to have a cigarette um, then uh, I could well change from being a lawful visitor to a trespasser because my permission doesn't extend to doing something which is forbidden smoking in the in on those premises so it's important to have that distinction and Tomlinson and Congleton Borough Council uh, illustrates this as well as a number of other points which we may well have we, we will be looking at later on what happened in this case was uh, the Congleton the council um, owned a piece of open land uh, which was a which was a kind of recreation park fairly fairly wild um, it had it had a, a lake uh, 
in it. Um, now, swimming in the lake uh, was prohibited. Uh, and uh, what, unfortunately what happened to, to the claimant, Tomlinson, who was a young man, uh, it, he wasn't 20 yet, he decided that he'd dive into the, into the lake. Well, he dived into a shallow part of the water, he did a, a running dive, um, he, his head struck a, uh, a shallow, it went, it, it struck, a, struck a sandy bed, uh, but he just kind of entered in, in, into shallow water. And the result of that, he suffered severe head injuries and neck injuries, which then left him paralysed. Uh, so he brought uh, his proceedings, but he had, or his lawyers, had to make the concession um, in the proceedings that the claimant had actually become a trespasser. And what had made him a trespasser was that although he was lawfully present in the park by doing something which was not permitted in this case diving into the into the pond because swimming in the pond was not permitted that had converted him from being a lawful visitor into a trespasser right so the common duty of care let's look at that now right uh, as I said at the very beginning the occupier's liability, uh, uh, the law of occupier's liability, is the law of ex about the extent to which somebody is liable uh, for the state or condition of premises which they occupy, and that's really very important. It is Occupier's Liability Act 1957, and also the 84 Act for that matter, relates to the state or condition of the premises. It doesn't relate to the activities that are carried on there. So if the uh, if the uh, harm falls before someone because of the state of the premises, somebody falls into a ditch, then there may be liability, but not if there is uh, uh, not in relation to any activities were carried on. So uh, the w when I say falls into a ditch, there will be liability under the 1957 Act. If activities are negligently conducted, then the Act does not apply, but the tort of negligence, the general tort of negligence, may apply instead. So, uh, and this distinction is clearly shown in the case Bottomley and Tomadon Cricket Club, 2004. It's a decision of the House of Lords. Um, what happened here was the claimant was uh, giving assistance at uh, the cricket club's annual fundraising event and he was giving assistance to a, a an act which had been brought on and it was a fireworks act, pyrotechnic act and they were actually called chaos encounter uh, and the the claimant was injured when uh, I mean it, it sounds incredibly dangerous anyway so maybe not surprising um, there was a tube which had been filled with petrol and an explosive device had been put down there presumably to well just to, for the thrill of creating a big explosion unfortunately the claimant was injured by this and he brought a claim based both on the Occupy's Liability Act 1957 and also under the tort of negligence but as far as the Occupier's Liability Act was concerned his claim failed and the reason for that was that the uh, giving the firework display was not actually anything to do with the state or condition of the premises it was an activity that was taking place on those premises and therefore that part of the claim failed he did actually succeed in his negligence claim, but under the 1957 Act, the claim failed. He should he succeeded um, because because it, uh, the duty of care uh, included making sure that there was a proper safety certificate in place um, uh, for this for this event and proper insurance as well. Uh, but as far as the 57 Act is concerned, the the this was an activity rather than taking place on the premises rather than uh, a claim relating to the state or condition of the premises right so the final point i have there so because so, so because it, the outcome would be particularly harsh, harsh perhaps if the claimant in bottomly had not been able to receive compensation but harm caused by careless activity on premises is subject to a claim in the tort of negligence so it goes two ways. Something to watch out for um, in uh, in in uh, seminar questions, exams, and so on and so forth. Uh, question is: Did the harm come about because of the state of the premises? Did it come about, be or did it come about because of the um, uh, an activity that was taking place? State of the premises, 1957 Act, 
activity, the tort of negligence. So, just to refresh our memory as to what the common duty of care means, and then we'll look at how the law has dealt, how, how, how the act develops our understanding of that, and as does the case law. So, the common duty of care. Uh, is a duty to take such care as is reasonable in the circumstances. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon. The common duty of care is a duty to take such care as is reasonable to see that the visitor will be reasonably safe in using the premises for the purpose for which he is invited or permitted by the occupier to be there. Remember the point I made earlier on. The duty relates to the safety of the visitor, not necessarily the safety of the premises. Right. So working through the content of that duty. First off, the Act in section uh, 2.3a uh, uh, makes the stipulation that uh, occupiers should be prepared for children to be less careful than adults. It speaks for itself, I, uh, I imagine. Um, so there's the 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 we, there's there is the possibility, as we all know, um, that young children, uh, teenagers and so on, will do things which are just daft. It's part of the human uh, condition. Now, uh, or, or just do things out of just straightforward ignorance um, of, of, of hazards as well. So Glasgow Corporation and Taylor is a, is a, is a nice clear illustration of this. Um, the, the claimant in this case was a young child um, who was uh, uh, age seven, who was visiting uh, a botanical gardens uh, in Glasgow uh, and he ate uh, he ate some berries, some poisonous berries from a bush uh, bright poisonous berries, he ate them uh, and obviously it had a, a, a serious nefarious effect on him. So the action was brought against uh, Glasgow Corporation and the, the, the claim succeeded, one because having bright berries is an allurement, it is, it is a lure or an allurement, it is alluring, it draws uh, the attention of uh, young children um, and the child was lawfully present on the premises so the uh, I mean clearly pre uh, the occupiers liability act but a duty of care and a duty of care response uh, would require that knowing that young children are lawfully present that proper uh, care should have been taken to make sure that they could not get access uh, to poisonous berries um, the quotation below Glasgow Corporation is actually um, from the uh, decision of the House of Lords in Jolly and Sutton uh, Borough Council, London Borough of Sutton. Uh, and this case involved a situation where there were, was an abandoned boat uh, on a piece of land owned by um, the council. Um, and unfortunately, uh, one of the claimants with his pal with his friend, so the claimant aged 14, had decided that they were going to try and repair the the boat. Um, as part of this activity, um, they got a car jack and they had jacked up the boat. Um, so they'd raised the boat above the ground with a car jack. And unfortunately, the claimant uh, was under the boat when the when the boat uh, uh, when the jack gave way, and the boat came down on his head. And again, he suffered head and neck injuries, which resulted in a paralysis. Um, the local the local authorities, the the council, um, did say in their evidence that they were aware that children were coming onto the premises uh, and they were aware that the boat could cause, could be an attraction to them. What they argued was that they, the only danger that they would have foreseen uh, was that the the children, children getting on the boat would fall through rotten planking on the boat. But they said that in the light of foreseeing that danger and not foreseeing the way this incident occurred, uh, this harm occurred, that they they should have made plans to remove the vessel, and it was held that the the vessel being for uh, being a foreseeable hazard to children, however that hazard might have materialised, uh, in, 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 
introduced the requirement that the vessel, the rotting vessel, should have been removed. And it was therefore held that the duty of care towards the children had been breached. In the process of giving judgment, Lord Hoffman says, and again, just pointing to the obvious, um, it has been repeatedly said about children that their ingenuity in finding unexpected ways of doing mischief to themselves and others should never be underestimated. So the position of the law, particularly when this hazard was, when the boat was known to be hazard, hazardous to children who were present on the land, then that should have done something about it. So it, in a way, it's an illustration of the good old remoteness of damage point. It's, if harm is foreseeable, it is the type of harm is foreseeable, then the way that the harm manifests itself that is not fatal, even if that is an unexpected way in which it's going to manifest itself, it's not going to be fatal to a claim. So they knew the boat was harmful. The fact that they might not have expected kids to get under there and try and jack it up with a car jack was irrelevant in this particular case, and therefore the claim succeeded. However, uh, we did talk about, um, uh, in, at the very beginning, we did mention the fact that uh, you might expect parents to supervise very young children. And this is the approach that the common law has taken. So an occupier uh, may expect very young children to be supervised and may expect that reasonable parents will not allow their children to put it, be put in danger without protection. Now, that statement that I've just read you is more or less a direct quotation from Mr. Justice Devlin, as he then was, in the case of Phipps and Rochester Corporation. And what happened in Phipps was uh, a little boy who was aged five was out blackberrying um, uh, with his sister who was seven. They lived nearby where they were blackberrying and they wandered onto a piece of land which was uh, which was a kind of demolition, a building site um, in a kind of state of, of, of half or semi-completion. Um, and children did come onto the land uh, and unfortunately little boy fell into a ditch which was, it seemed, seems not completely concealed, uh, but there was long grass, there was some grass around it. He fell into a ditch and he broke his leg. Um, the claim failed uh, on the basis that um, there was uh, a duty to the children, uh, but there was equally an entitlement for the occupiers of premises to expect that young children would actually be properly supervised uh, and not put in danger. And this line of thinking was reiterated in Bourne Leisure and Marsden in 2001, which is the case that I based the initial one of the initial scenarios on. What happened in this case was uh, a, a a family was staying at a leisure park uh, stroke campsite uh, and uh, when they signed in uh, they were given information about the hazards on the campsite and in the leisure park. So it had woodland, it had ponds and so on and they were told where the locations were. Uh, and generally it was made plain to them that there were it, it, the 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 premises could contain hazards for young children. Well, unfortunately, what happened on this occasion, uh, the um, the claimant's mother, uh, who was supervising a two-year-old child, was talking to her neighbour, and as she was distracted in her conversation, the two-year-old child uh, wandered off, and he wandered down a woodland path and then fell into a pond and drowned. Um, and uh, he brought proceedings, uh, uh, and, well they were brought clearly on his behalf, uh, and the, the argument was that given the nature of the hazard, and given the fact that young children were present, that the pond should have been fenced off. And in fact it was argued that the, uh, the, the, the kind of precautions uh, that people might take if they have a pond in their own back garden uh, and little children should be this level of precaution that should have been taken with the ponds and the leisure park. Again, it was held along the lines of Phipps that in fact in this situation a very young child, age two, would not be expected to be able to wander off on his own and that by giving the general warnings about the hazardous nature of the or the potential hazards of the of on the park, the duty the common duty of care had been discharged. As far as uh, uh, 
further elucidation of the um, common duty of care, uh, the Act does also provide that people who come onto premises uh, uh, who are skilled visitors on those premises, obviously for the purpose of their, can, an activity, an invited activity there, can be expected uh, to understand what the risks are in the job that they're, they're, go, they're doing. So a person in the exercise of his calling will appreciate and guard against any special risks ordinarily incident to that calling or to the calling. So. Um, so if I bring an electrician into my house um, to fix the wiring, the reason I brought the electrician in is because I assume that they know that the uh, that how the electric wiring is a hazardous um, is hazardous in the uh, if interfered with by people who don't know what they're doing. They know what the risks are. If the electrician ends up electrocuting himself, then normally turn around and say, well, you were the electrician. I wasn't. That's why That's why you were hired to do this. Um, so and this is illustrated in the case of Rolls and Nathan, which was decided in 1963. And this involved uh, uh, two chimney sweeps who died in circumstances which in the end were never really explained. But they had been um, they'd been engaged um, in a in a in an industrial setting to clean and do some repair work on some boilers, uh, and they uh, they'd stopped the work during the day because they'd run out of materials. In fact, they'd run out of cement, um, and were due to come back the next day to continue the work. Well, the next day um, they were actually found dead. Of carbon monoxide poisoning in the boilers, um, it, it all got in, into the kind of chambers of the boilers, uh, and it was held that in those circumstances they were chimney sweeps. Uh, they knew um, the risks that were inherent in getting in, in 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 working in enclosed spaces where 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 heating system was in operation, and therefore there was no liability because their expertise, their calling, uh, was such that they should have appreciated the risks and been able to guard against them from themselves. As far as warnings are concerned, um, a, uh, an occupier can discharge the duty of care by giving uh, warnings as long as they're sufficient uh, to make the visitor reasonably safe. Um, in Poppleton uh, and the Trustees of Portsmouth Youth Activity Centre, recent decision of the Court of Appeal, 2008 decision. Um, this involved a claim by a, uh, a young man who had visited the centre before uh, and on this occasion uh, he was vi visiting the centre to use a climbing wall in the centre and he decided that he would leap from the top of the climbing wall to try and catch hold of a buttress. Um, uh, there were signs around uh, the premises uh, prohibiting leaping. They weren't actually in the in the build in the in the room uh, or the hall with the climbing wall in it, but they were displayed elsewhere. Um, he, in the leap, he, he was unsuccessful. He fell to the ground. Uh, he fell awkwardly and was severely injured as a result of that fall, fall of 30 feet. Um, it was held um, that the risks inherent in what he was doing were obvious and therefore there was no liability. Um, but there is no need to warn of obvious dangers. So in Staples and West Dorset, um, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, claimant slipped on the cob or harbour wall at uh, at Lyme Regis, um, it's a it's a Georgian structure, an early Georgian structure, um, and uh, this it made of granite, uh, and this it was wet and it had algae on it, uh, and the claimant slipped and it was held that the danger of walking on that granite surface next to the sea uh, was obvious, and therefore there was no liability. Slightly different situation in Clare and Perry, um, which involved a woman who who leapt over a six-foot wall, uh, or leapt down from a six-foot wall to get to a coast road. She and her partner had been at a uh, at a, a, a social event at a hotel by the sea, and they decided when the bus uh, that was going to due to take them back to the town where they were staying. Uh, 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 couldn't take them, so they were presumably had to wait for the next one. Um, they'd have a look at the the coast, they'd have a look at the stars and the sky, and her partner 
um, who, who, who happen to have a part of one leg amputated and a, and a bad hip, he, 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 got off, he, he went over the wall and dropped down about two to three feet and suffered no ill effect. So the claimant decided that if, I guess, uh, a partner missing a bit of a leg suffered no ill effect, um, she should hop over the wall as well. Well, the wall that she hopped over had a six foot drop uh, and therefore at night uh, she fell and she was injured and it was held again that leaping over a wall without checking uh, and just relying on the fact that your partner had survived it uh, the drop uh, uh, was uh, was not the basis of liability the risk of leaping over a wall in the dark is obvious and therefore the claim was the claim would fail All right uh, just a couple of points finally on the common duty of care um, the uh, uh, an occupier can avoid liability if they have appointed an independent contractor to do work and took reasonable steps to establish the competence of that contractor. So if I, um, if I get a builder to come and repair my chimney uh, and he, he does that negligently, then and the chimney falls on somebody then in those circumstances um, it uh, as long as I have acted reasonably and I've and I've made sure of the competence of the contractor the liability will be the contractors and not mine and this point is illustrated in the case Ferguson and Welsh I must point out that in the note in the hand in the manual I have the case listed as Ferguson and Walsh not Ferguson and Welsh and that's a mistake um, so point that out to you um, but acting reasonably might include also checking current certificates of insurance and then as a final point on the 1957 Act uh, the common duty of care and ex exclusion um, liability can be excluded but it's now governed uh, by the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977 which by now you're familiar with um, from contract law so I'm not going to delay you unduly with that save to say that uh, two things which I'm sure you sure will come as no surprise for you uh, an occupier cannot uh, by a notice or contractual term or other means exclude liability for death or personal injury section 2 subsection 1 other loss so damage to property for example can only be excluded if the exclusion or limitation clause satisfies the test of reasonableness so now turning to the position of trespassers uh, and the operation of the Occupiers Liability Act 1984. So as we said, uh, lawful visitors, uh, the duties, their entitlements are governed by the 1957 Act. Trespassers, so those who enter without a permission or without being invited, uh, their position is now governed by the 1984 Occupiers Liability Act. It's worth saying before uh, before we get going on this is that before um, the 1950 before the 1948 big pardon, before the 1984 Act uh, came into effect, the position as far as trespassers were concerned was governed by a duty of humanity. So in theory, certainly for a long time no duties were owed to trespassers on the basis that uh, uh, they'd not been invited onto the land the law would give them no protection uh, and but it but an important decision uh, 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 Harrington and British Railways Board uh, before 1984 created a duty of humanity owed to um, to visitors uh, to trespassers uh, and you can take from the type from 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 the way the duty is described that that was actually a considerably lesser duty than the duty of care the 1984 act now governs the situation uh, and so the act governs the occupier's duty in respect of the risk of injury on premises because of a danger due to the state of the premises so that's section one subsection one of the act so the first thing to point out is that the liability to occupy uh, of the occupier to the risk uh, to the to a trespasser is in relation to the risk of injury the act does not give remedies in relation to damage 
to property. So if you remember Miss Patel, who fell into the ditch whilst trespassing, um, if she breaks her leg, she may have a remedy. We shall see. But if she's, she also then ruins her suit, her briefcase as she's going to work by falling into the ditch, then as far as the 84 Act is concerned, it does not give her a remedy for the damage to her to her um, property. So first, um, where does, when does the uh, occupier's duty arise? Well, we're told when it arises by section 1, subsection 3 of the Act, and it arises where an occupier is aware of a danger or has reasonable grounds to believe it exists. So um, there is either the uh, uh, test of actual knowledge, did the occupier know of the danger, or... Uh, the test, which is a kind of negligence sort of chest, test, would a reasonable person or would a reasonable occupier, more precisely, have uh, grounds to believe that the uh, uh, that the danger exists? So, if um, the occupier isn't aware of danger, and if it was su in circumstances such that a reasonable occupier would not have been aware of the danger either, then in those circumstances liability will not exist. And that's illustrated in the case of Rind and As. Ashbury Water Park, uh, 2004, decision of the High Court. And what happened in this case was the claimant, who was a trespasser, um, dived into a lake, a reservoir, uh, in order to retrieve a football. And as he entered the water, his head struck a, a submerged fiberglass container, which was on the bed a pond uh, bed uh, and uh, he suffered very serious head and shoulder injuries um, and that left him with a permanent disability so he brought a claim uh, based on the occupiers liability act 1984 now the occupier um, had not placed the container on the water's bed on the pond's bed and uh, had no way of seeing it by a visual inspection of the of the of the water from the from the banks and so it was held that there the occupier didn't know of the existence of the danger or and didn't have reasonable grounds to believe it exists because he couldn't see it um, or his staff couldn't see it um, from the from the banks and therefore the claim failed so first off to trigger the duty there has to be an awareness or reasonable grounds to believe in the existence of the danger the second trigger mechanism uh, is that is it relates to awareness of the possibility that there might be trespassers coming onto the land so so the second test is and the occupier knows or has reasonable grounds to believe that the trespasser will be in the vicinity will come into the vicinity um, of, of the danger so 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 this looks at awareness of the existence of trespassers so in the initial uh, case, example that I gave um, if uh, the county council the Yorkshire County Council was aware that people were trespassing on its land one of the triggers may have actually been fired uh, for liability um, in, in uh, as uh, under the 1984 Occupiers Liability Act and the case Donahue and Folkestone illustrates both sides of that proposition very well what happened in this case was the claimant Folkestone was a professional diver and he dived into a harbour um, at after midnight in midwinter and he hit his head on a metal structure which was in the water uh, and again as in the other cases suffered severe injuries which left him with a permanent disability now during the summer uh, the uh, the authority actually had signs around the harbour prohibiting diving and swimming but during the winter those signs were actually removed and were taken down so during the summer uh, it was clear uh, from the behavior of the of the authority that they were aware that people would trespass by diving into the diving into the water and had sought to protect themselves clearly by giving warnings uh, but it was held as a fact that the authority did not know 
or have uh, or have reasonable grounds to believe that a trespasser would be diving into the water after midnight in midwinter and therefore the claim failed um, the claimant argued that the sign should not have been removed but it was held in this case that the, fourth, the, the knowledge of the of the trespasser or reasonable grounds to believe that the trespasser would be in the vicinity uh, that that test was not satisfied in the case of somebody diving into the water at after midnight in the midwinter. So the occupier has to have uh, awareness of the or reasonable grounds of, for awareness of the danger and also there has to be a degree of awareness in relation to the occupier being in the vicinity. So you will see then that the act kind of builds up in layers um, the the stages that can lead to the liability of an occupier towards a trespasser. So in addition then to uh, awareness of the danger or the rules around awareness of danger and the rules around awareness of the trespasser being in the vicinity, the next stage is to consider that the risk is one which in all the circumstances the occupier may be reasonably expected to offer some protection. So the danger is such that it is reasonable to offer some protection against it. Uh, and this is uh, illustrated very clearly in the case Ratcliffe and McConnell, which also begins to show another point, which is as far as liability to occupiers is concerned, there is a distinction between, on the one hand, latent dangers, maybe the, you know, the concealed uh, trap, as it were, so the concealed ditch, and uh, dangers which are actually obvious for all to see. So it wasn't something which is kind of hidden uh, in, in, in on the premises in some way. So in Ratcliffe and McConnell, um, in this case, another head injuries case, I'm afraid, um, the claimant had been uh, drinking with his friends at the college bar on the college premises. Um, and at the end of the evening, they left the bar and um, they one they decided that they would get into the open air swimming pool. Now the college grounds were uh, patrolled by security staff, and the swimming pool was actually fenced off. And there were signs prohibiting uh, s uh, swimming outside uh, the the allowed uh, the allowed times. Well, the claimant in this case climbed over the fence and then executed a running dive and struck his head in the shallow end. So he entered the swimming pool in the shallow end uh, and as a result of that he suffered permanent disabilities. So he sued uh, the college uh, uh, basing his claim on the Occupiers Liability Act um, 1984, forced to base it on that basis as a trespasser in that, pond, in that pool um, and the claim failed. And the claim failed because in fact the risks uh, had had some precaution uh, taken. So the risk of somebody just inadvertently stumbling into the swimming pool on a dark night would have been covered by the fact that there were there were fences. There were warnings um, against uh, swimming outside the allowed times, but uh, uh, and swimming uh, swimming without permission. Uh, uh, but importantly, the risk of diving headfirst into a shallow end of a swimming pool was so obvious there was no need to guard further against it than the precautions had actually already been taken. So next layer is the risk is one which in all the circumstances the occupier may be reasonably expected to offer some protection. Then final layer, how does this duty develop? So in relation to the, that, the, the risk and then the duty is to take such care as is reasonable in all the circumstances of the case to see that the trespasser does not suffer injury on the premises by reason of the danger concerned. So once there is a risk and the, there is a, an obligation there's such that there should be uh, precautions, protection offered against that risk, then the duty then goes on to say, so the duty is breached if there weren't adequate protection, adequate precautions being taken against this. So in Tomlinson and Congleton uh, Borough Council, uh, which we mentioned right at the very beginning, a case where a young man dived into a pond 
uh, into a lake. As he dived, he became he changed from being a lawful visitor into a trespasser, um, and uh, the he broke he he broke his neck uh, and suffered head injuries as a result of that. His argument was, uh, I mean, there were signs prohibiting um, the uh, the um, uh, diving uh, and other kinds of activities as well, like uh, windsurfing. Um, and the authority had actually at once the owner, the authority at one stage had decided that it might well have to plant vegetation on the edge of the pond uh, to stop people getting in, so get some reeds up uh, uh, growing and so on. Uh, but again, just a simple illustration of the point. It was uh, it, this was the risks of diving into a pond are so clear that in fact there was no further need for any precaution other than the ones that had already been taken uh, and therefore the, the duty hadn't been breached. But the, the other side of the coin is illustrated in, uh, in the case of Kent uh, Young and Kent County Council, decision of the High Court in 2005. And what happened here was that uh, school premises um, out of hours were uh, were used to host um, a uh, a youth club, uh, and on the occasion that gave rise to to this claim, uh, the claimant had been in the youth club, so he'd uh, he'd he was kind of present uh, on the pre on, on most on the, on this in the youth club, um, uh, uh, not as a trespasser, and then he joined a group of people outside playing with a football. The football had then managed somehow to be uh, uh, kicked or thrown onto the roof of the school. So the claimant climbed uh, 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 a grating on the side of the school to get onto the school roof. And, and whilst he was on the school roof, he, he trod on a skylight. In fact, he jumped on the skylight and he fell through and he was quite seriously injured. So his um so his claim was made under the 1984 act um it was denied as f on the part of the county council responsible for the school that they had breached uh, the duty on the facts the local authority knew that the uh, that children would get on to the roof uh, they had done so before and they knew that children were in the vicinity uh, the uh they as far as standing on the uh, skylight was concerned, the court held that the, the claimant couldn't be expected to know that the, the skylight was actually as fragile as it was. Um, uh, but the important point was that the precaution that could have been taken, uh, the care that could have been taken, was to cover the grating so that young people could not uh, be able to get onto the roof and therefore the breach of the duty taken care because they hadn't taken sufficient the breach it, it, uh, had, had occurred because they hadn't taken sufficient care to stop people from getting onto the roof which was a measure which could have been quite easily taken so where, there you have uh, contrasts of the of, of the two. I have to say, in the case of Young Kent County Council, um, the claimant was found 50% contributorily negligent, so he didn't get the full claim, uh, but uh, but it was held that there would be liability. And so I just want to kind of finish off on the duties of trespasser to to show you um, th uh, how the thinking of the law has actually developed along these lines uh, with three fairly recent uh, three fairly recent cases. Uh, and the first one is Kern and uh, uh, Coventry Healthcare Trust, which is uh, which is an interesting case because uh, it, it, you can imagine that. Uh, the, that in the light of this, young might have been considered in a slightly different way. It might have come out in a slightly different way. But what happened in Kern was that this involved a claimant trespasser who was aged 11. And he was one of a number of youngsters who regularly uh, were present uh, in, in hospital grounds. Uh, and what he decided that he would do was uh, to climb up a fire escape uh, but the, he didn't climb up the fire escape the normal way. He decided to climb up the outside of the fire escape uh, and managed to then fall off the fire escape from several feet up 
and was severely hurt uh, and his injuries were physical but also uh, the brain damage produced uh, that he suffered produced um, personality change so quite a quite well very serious consequences for him um, his claim failed uh, and the reason that his claim failed is that he knew he, uh, he gave in evidence he knew one that he had no right to be on the fire escape he knew that what he was doing was wrong and he also knew that what he was doing was dangerous and in those circumstances the court held that the uh, local authority were not going to be held uh, the hospital authority were not going to be held to be liable for somebody who would climb up on the outside and the court was also uh, harking back to this point about the the grey uh, and dull safety regime the court considered what the alternatives were what precautions could have actually been taken and it would effectively mean that the whole of the grounds uh, would have had to have been closed off and actually one of the points they made is that the kind of the the as the grounds were, were at one stage fairly open to the public and pleasant places to be, there'd be a loss of a kind of social benefit um, that people could wander in, couldn't want, could no longer wander in the grounds, uh, which would be the cost of trying to take the precaution to stop a young boy from climbing up the outside of a fire escape. So the claim failed. Similarly, a claim failed in Maloney and Torfan. Um, uh, uh, what happened here? was uh, Maloney brought an action against his local authority um, because he had uh, he was traveling home one night um, fr having been drinking um, his son in evidence said uh, that uh, he the claimant had had three or four pints of beer the judge said that he took that with a pinch of salt so it was obviously uh, much the worse for wear and to get back to his flats, instead of following the normal route, he decided that he would walk across the top of a, an embanking, uh, a, a, a retaining wall, and the retaining wall uh, was the was at the top of a, a subway. So obviously, an underground uh, road uh, passageway. He decided that he'd walk uh, across the top of this. Um, in fact, um, he, he didn't quite manage to do that, so he fell and was injured. Uh, and somebody had been previously injured, not long, I want to say previously injured, but had been killed not long before that. It was held in the case that the risk of what he was doing was obvious, although the judge said it might not have been obvious to somebody who was drunk, uh, but the risk uh, was obvious and therefore the claim uh, the claim failed. And that was even though um, the, even though uh, accidents of this kind had happened previously and the local authority was aware that people would 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 walk on the high walk on the retaining wall as a shortcut uh, and would and would fall and be injured but the risks were obvious and therefore the claim failed and then the final sad case another head injury case um, is Baldacino and West Wittering uh, estate uh, the facts of the case were that the claimant uh, a youth um, had uh, swum out to a marker boy or a navigation boy um, I uh, on a beach uh, and he clambered onto the navigation boy. He'd actually, uh, he and his friends apparently had been swimming around and doing it during, uh, during earlier during the day. So he'd, this ha the incident occurred after lunch. Um, they, the, um, the lifeguards on the beach if they saw people doing it would uh, tell them to get off uh, and the boy clearly knew that he wasn't supposed to be on there in fact um, they'd been told uh, earlier uh, warned earlier in the day that they shouldn't be on the on the boy so the so the lad um, got on to the so the claimant got on to the the boy um, unfortunately the tide was going out uh, and he dived into the water he dived into a shallow quantity of water uh, and uh, and again suffered head injuries and neck injuries and had a permanent disability as a result of that paralysis as a result of that his claim failed uh, uh, he was a trespasser so the boy is uh, is uh, was premises for the purposes of the legislation he was a trespasser and the important point to consider in this case was that it wasn't that the boy 
was dangerous. W what was dangerous was the activity that was undertaken by the youth. So the marker boy, the premises themselves, was no danger in those which it would be reasonable to, to offer some protection against. The danger came from the activity that was undertaken by the boy and therefore on that basis his claim failed. So there you have it, um, occupier's liability, uh, two acts, the 1957 Act deals with the uh, liability to, uh, to lawful visitors clearly an act which is uh, which is replicating or seeking to replicate uh, in statutory form the common law duty of cares in the form of the common duty of care as far as trespass are concerned it's a much more narrow duty for a start the duty only relates to injury it doesn't relate to damage to property and you can see that it is clearly focused on dangers which it is reasonable to offer some precaution against and it turns on awareness or, the due or, or reasonable grounds for believing the awareness of that danger and also awareness or reasonable grounds for believing that the trespasser will be in the vicinity. And you can see that from the general run of the case on trespassers that the courts are particularly uh, uh, keen to ensure that where risks are obvious then in those circumstances people who are regarded as the authors of their misfortune should not be able to use the tort law system to recover compensation on that basis. Thank you.